life. It teaches you so much. And so this morning we are looking at the story of Cain and Abel. We're in a series called More Than Ordinary where we're looking at men and women of God who, uh, men and women of the Bible, some of them had great faith in God, some of them had great flaws, and, um, and there were challenges in their life. And we're going to look at their lives and learn stories, uh, learn their stories, but then also glean from them about how God is calling us to live. And through some of these men, we'll see that they're men and women, we'll see that they're ordinary people. They're people just like you and I, but because they believed and trusted in an extraordinary God, these men and women were able to do great and mighty things for God. And this morning, we look at the story of Cain and Abel. Last week, we looked at Adam and Eve, and so today we begin to talk about their children. It's a story that's so well known among so many people, even people that haven't read the Bible know about Cain and Abel. It's a story that is dark, it's tragic, it's um, from the very beginning of it till the very end of it. I'm a father of three kids. My oldest is about to turn 11 next month, which is crazy. But when I read this story, when I read the story of Cain and Abel, my mind goes back to what are Adam and Eve thinking as they're waiting for the birth of their first son. What's going through their mind as they're anxiously waiting through that pregnancy season, waiting for this child to be born. So many hopes, so many dreams for their child, for Cain. And no doubt, they hoped he would make a huge difference in the world. And you know, Cain did make a difference. Cain did make a mark, but as is the case often, Things did not turn out the way their parents intended. And instead of fulfilling their dreams, their first baby boy, their first son, the firstborn after the fall, broke their hearts and left a trail of blood and tears in his wake. In the passage in Genesis 4, there's so many firsts. There's the first birth. There are the first brothers. There's the first shepherd. There's the first... Um, farmer, there's the first offerings, there's the first worship service, there's the first murder, there's the first cover-up. And the key to understanding this story is found in one word that's repeated over and over in the first uh, nine or eleven verses. It's the idea that Cain killed his brother. Cain kills his brother, and that point is made in numerous verses here. The shock of the story is not that Cain just killed a man. It's not that he just found someone and killed him, but the fact is Cain killed his own flesh and blood. He killed his own family. The word is repeated over and over so that we'll never forget it. And there's so much in this story that we don't know that we wish we knew. Like questions come to my mind of, what was the age difference between Cain and Abel? How old? How, how, how many years apart were they? What were their growing up years like? Why did one of them choose to become a farmer and the other one choose to become a shepherd? How did they know that they were supposed to bring an offering to God? How did Cain know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted, but Abel's, uh, Cain's sacrifice was rejected? What was the mark that's talked about that God puts a mark on Cain? What was that mark? What was that look like? You know, for all of these things, we must simply say that we don't have enough information to give a definitive answer, but there are two things we know for sure from this story. Number one, the first murder takes place within a family context. It was within a family. And number two, the first murder takes place immediately after a worship service. Think about that for a second. Both of them were standing before God, worshiping, giving an offering. Modern day context, they might have been here singing songs, hands raised. And as soon as they walked out of here, the other side came out. We might read this story and say, that's not us. Cain is not me. But can I suggest to you that Cain is exactly us? Because it's so easy for us to be able to come into worship and sing songs about Jesus and declare how good and faithful and loving he is, how gracious he is that he would forgive us of our sins. But then we can walk out of here 
and we can hold on to bitterness and rage and anger toward people in our lives. In fact, sometimes often to people that are incredibly close to us. Cain is you and me. It is us when we, let, when we leave our hearts unchecked. And as we begin, we see the progress of sin in the story. You remember last week, Genesis 3, um, the serpent had to come in and she had to, he had to work hard to deceive Eve. He had to convince Eve, did God really tell you this? Did God really say that, you will, um, that this fruit is not good? And he had to do all of this stuff to convince Eve that she should eat the fruit. But when you read Genesis 4, Before Cain commits the murder, God pleads with him and warns him and says, hey, be careful because your sin is crouching at the door. And in Genesis 4, God can't even convince Cain not to sin. Genesis 3, the serpent had to deceive. Genesis 4, God can't even change a man's heart in this story. What started as deception moves to deliberate sin and now leads leads to a premeditated murder. Can I suggest that it was a sign of things to come? There is a direct line that stretches from the blood of Abel to all the killings that are happening today in Syria, in Iraq, in Africa, and to every shooting that happens on every street corner in every city around the world. There's a direct connection between these two stories. And consider this. Cain and Abel appeared the same on the outside. When you read the first couple verses, read like the first two or three verses, you have no idea which one is going to turn out good and which one's going to turn out bad. You have no idea who's going to be the killer and who's going to be the victim. Cain and Abel, they shared the same parents. They had the same spiritual background. They had the same home life. And no doubt they heard stories from Adam and Eve about what life was like in paradise and how much they enjoyed the presence of God on a daily basis, but they screwed it up because of their sin. And they probably heard all of these stories. And yet, As often happens in families today, one boy goes in one direction, the other boy goes in another. One follows God, the other one follows his own desires, and one man murders his brother. And what I want to do this morning is break this text up into three different portions. I want to look at the story of two brothers and share a little bit about them, and then from there I want to talk about a murder that God, even God, couldn't stop, and then talk about the murderer's punishment. So look at what I mean from verses 1 through 5. It says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the first fruit, firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain... And his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. I already noted this earlier, but Cain and Abel had a lot in common. They shared the same parents, the same spiritual influence. They both had good jobs. They both bring an offering to God. The only difference is that Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's sacrifice was rejected. And why does this happen? We really don't know exactly. Scripture doesn't point out. And several commentators have a lot of different opinions on it, but there might be a difference in the quality of the offering. The text seems to suggest that Cain kind of knew it was time for worship, and he just went and gathered some fruit and quickly went before God. And he just flippantly went in the presence of God. But Abel went and found the firstborn, the best that he had, and he brought that before God. If that is why this happened, it suggests that Cain was just going through the motions of worship. He was simply doing stuff for the sake of doing stuff, but Abel was ready for worship. He was excited for worship. He was passionate about being in the presence of God, and he brings to God the very best that he could give. He doesn't just wake up and say, oh, it's Sunday morning, let me just get out there. He comes ready, excited, prepared for worship. Hebrews 11 says... Now, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. 
By faith, he was commended a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead. See, whatever we may say about these two offerings, the difference is not in what they brought. The difference was their heart in when they brought it. When Abel came before God, he had faith. He understood that he was standing before the living God. He knew that when he was in worship, that God was there and he wanted to give God his very best. But Cain was like, oh, it's just something I have to do. He was just going through the motions. Verse 4 says that God looked on favor on Abel and his offering. The order there is crucial. God first looked at the man, then he looked at the offering. He looks at our heart first, and then he looks at what we bring. And the same is true even for Cain. God looked at Cain, and then he looked at his offering. And Cain's absence of faith guaranteed that his offering would be rejected. Listen, our praise, our worship, our sacrifice is only acceptable to God when it's offered in an acceptable spirit. Where there is no faith, even the finest offerings cannot make up the difference. So Cain is now angry. He's all burned up, and he saw that his offering had been rejected, but that his kid brother's offering had been accepted. And his face was visibly upset. But it shouldn't have surprised him. It shouldn't have taken him by shock. His defective offering came from his defective heart. His brother wasn't the problem. The problem was that he was his own worst enemy. And now in verses 6 through 8, we see God speaking through Cain and warning him about his heart about the danger that he was about to enter. And read with me verse 6 through verse 8. It says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his Abel, his brother. And when he When they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. The questions that God is asking, they're rhetorical. God already knows the answers. He simply forces Cain to face his own sin. Cain was so angry at Abel that he couldn't face his own personal failure. And God's offer is genuine. Cain, if you would just come with the right attitude. Cain, if you would do this right, if you, if you would be in a right attitude when you come, if you would do right, then your sacrifice would be accepted. See, the door was open for both brothers, but it had to be entered by faith. Going through the motions is not going to get God's approval. The phrase there, sin, is crouching at your door. The imagery is the image of a lion, ready, waiting to pounce on Cain and destroy him. What started as sibling jealousy now leads to anger and now veers perilously close to rage. And if Cain is not careful, sin will overcome him and will master him. He's on the brink of destruction, and as he sways on the abyss, God wants him to know you can go in the other direction. You don't have to keep going in this direction. This is the battle that is going on for the soul of Cain. And right now, sin has the upper hand. But God says there's time to change. You know the story, you know what happened. Cain lures his brother Abel into a field where no one can see them, and then he rises up against his brother. The idea there is a sudden surprise attack, and he kills him. Probably used a rock and to beat him, and his blood is now all over the ground. It's a bloody murder. His blood is mentioned twice in our text. But why would Cain kill his brother? Why would he murder his own flesh and blood? If you think about it, the answer is simple, really. There's two reasons. One, he wanted to remove the competition. And number two, he wanted to get even with God. The only way to, quote-unquote, hurt God was to kill the man whose offering God had accepted. It was a sick, twisted logic, but in his rage, Cain was not thinking straight. You know how easy it is to hurt the people we love? No one makes us more angry 
than the members of our own family, right? The meanest things we say are things that we say to the people closest to us. We often show kindness to people we hardly know, but we treat our loved ones as if they were the scum of the earth. And think about it. One minute you're making an offering to God, and the next you're murdering your own flesh and blood. How quickly the heart can turn from worship to mayhem. Can I suggest there's a little bit of Cain in all of us, but there's a lot of Cain in most of us. And now, in verses 9 through 16, we see the punishment that Cain receives. Look at, look at me at 9 through 16. God speaks to Cain and says, Cain, where is Abel your brother? Cain replies, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to God, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and your face and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on this earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord says to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, the vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The rest of the story quickly unfolds. Verse 9, there is a total denial of responsibility. Cain lies to God. He says, I don't know where my brother is. And then he denies that it should even matter. It took awesome callousness to flippantly say to God, am I my brother's keeper? It's a denial of the very purpose of a human family. Brothers are supposed to stick together no matter what happens. But somehow that basic family obligation never sinks in with Cain. And in verse 10 and 12, God sentences him to restless wandering. Evidently, evidently, he buried Abel's body thinking no one would ever see what happened. But God knew exactly what happened, and he heard the cry of Abel's blood as it poured on the ground. Cain sentences two things that God tells him. One, he's going to continue to work the ground, but the ground will produce no fruit for him. And two, he will roam the earth, a man who will move restlessly from one place to another, never quite finding a place that he can call home. In verses 13 to 14, we see that there's a fear and uncertainty. I don't know if you saw that, but the awesome selfishness of Cain when God's judgment falls on him. All of his concern is about himself and his fears. In verse 13 to 14, it says, I, me, my, me. The man who killed his brother only cares about himself. He doesn't even express a single twinge of doubt, remorse, contrition, or repentance to the fact that he killed his brother. Besides being a brutal murderer, he's a selfish, spoiled, pathetic loser. His only concern was, now someone might try to kill me. And in verse 15, we see God's promise of protection in the midst of punishment. God says no one's going to be able to touch you. If they do, the punishment they will receive is seven times what you will get. See, whatever the mark was, we don't know for sure what it was, it guaranteed Cain a very long time to live. And that was a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing in the fact that no one would kill him. But it was a curse because he will now live a long, restless, unfulfilled life. But the protection of God will afford him time to get right with God, even though there is no suggestion in scriptures that Cain ever did get himself right with God. Verse 16, we see that he ends up living his life wholly, completely apart from God. Here's one of the ironies of this story. You know, God would have been fully justified to kill Cain immediately. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. But the righteous man dies in this story. The guilty man lives. Thus we see the mystery and the mercy mercy of God. The word nod, where Cain eventually goes to, literally means wandering. Cain left God's presence because he showed no desire for repentance. Since sin couldn't stay in the presence of God, 
he now voluntarily departs from God. He's the perfect picture of a man who lives under God's protection even while living in rebellion against God. Take a step back from the story, we can see why this sin is so great. He kills his own brother. He kills him in the context of worship. He kills him after rejecting God's warning. And then he denies responsibility, and then he refuses to accept his punishment. There is nothing positive you can say about Cain in this story. Meanwhile, sin itself has taken a deeper hold in the human heart as it passes from one generation to another. What started as a revolt um, with Adam and Eve now becomes a tidal wave of death in the next generation. One child is dead. The other roams a world restless, hopeless, helpless. Seen from Abel's side, it looks like this. The first man who died, he died for his faith. Killed by a religious man, who hated his righteousness. And you take that story and you move to the New Testament. Cain and Abel, who are actually people in history, they become symbols of a greater reality. In Matthew 23, Jesus cites Abel as the first in a long line of martyrs who were put to death because by those who reject God. In Hebrews 11, we read that he's the first example of someone who lived by faith. In Hebrews 12, it talks about the blood of Abel that cries for justice. As for Cain, 1 John talks about him as an example of one who belonged to the devil and whose life displayed hatred that led to murder. He's the prototype unbeliever who does not know God and does not have eternal life. And Jude 11 speaks of false teachers who follow the way of Cain, meaning that they not only reject the truth, but persist in following falsehood and leading others to destruction along with them. Francis Schaeffer is a theologian who's written numerous books, and he wrote a commentary on the book of Genesis called Space and Time. And he had one chapter in that book called The Two Humanities. And he sees Cain and Abel representing two great divisions in the human race. Cain is the first unbeliever while Abel is the first true worshiper of God. Everyone in the world is either in the line of Cain or you're in the line of Abel. Think about that for a moment. If we were to do a character sketch on both of these individuals, when we look at Cain, we would use words like proud, stubborn, cynical, sullen, defiant, angry, Unforgiving, devious, violent, resentful, scheming, self-reliant, clever, very religious. That would be the description that we would give Cain. On the other hand, Abel, he would appear to be humble, honest, a man of faith, a true believer who offered his very best to God and was murdered as a result. See, seen in that light, the bottom line of this story is all about going through the motions of religion versus true worship of God. Cain versus Abel is strength versus weakness. It's about a humanistic approach to God that rejects the humility of faith in favor of doing things your own way. Cain's religion is the religion of the world that rejects the way of the cross. In today's vernacular, the way of Cain is the way of those who wished to downplay the bloody sacrifice of Jesus in favor of tolerance, in favor of tolerance, diversity, and pluralism. Modern-day Cain's want nothing to do with the narrow-minded approach of those who believe that there is no other way to Jesus, no other way to heaven but through Jesus. Cain speaks today to those of us who tell us that the only way to heaven is through good works and not through a new birth. And what's the weakness of Abel? It's the weakness that comes to God that says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. My good works are like filthy rags. Even that is tainted with sin. 
I can't boast of anything good that I have done. It is only because of the blood of Jesus that I can be called a child of God. It is the weakness of the cross versus the power of the world. It's the shame of the cross versus the glory of the world. It is the reproach of the cross versus the power of those who think that they don't need Jesus. Cain represents all the self-made men in the world who attempt to come to God on their own terms. But God says to Cain then and God says to us now, if you try to come your own way, no deal. No deal. You either come my way or you don't come at all. Abel stands for all humble believers who have rejected the world and are being rejected by it and who nevertheless come to God by faith, laying hold of the bloody cross of Jesus as their only hope for life. As we're on this story, let me give you three points of application, I think, that sticks out. Three things that helps us to think through sin. Number one, small sins soon become big sins. Small sins soon become big sins. See, I don't think Cain woke up that morning planning to murder his brother. Why would he? No doubt he had envied his brother for a long time, but that sort of thing normally doesn't lead to murder. Once his anger took a hold of him, it was only a short step before he would do the unthinkable. Sin is like that, guys. It's a lion crouching, quietly waiting, biding its time, looking for an opening, and then pouncing when we least expect it. See, those things that we meddle with, that we're like, oh, this doesn't affect anyone. It's just my, it's just me. My anger, it doesn't affect anyone. Me looking at stuff I shouldn't be looking at online, it doesn't affect anyone. That jealous spirit in my heart, it doesn't affect anyone. Be careful. Small sins eventually become big sins. Small sins eventually will destroy you. Second thing, great sins are never as sudden as they seem. It doesn't just happen overnight. Just as sin crouched at Cain's door, even so it crouches at your door and mine door, my door. Beware of your anger. Watch out for the temptation to nurse a wounded spirit. Beware of hidden bitterness and the grudges you nurse in secret. Don't say, I'll never kill anyone. James points out in James 1, sin starts as a tiny seed that leads to a wrong desire that eventually leads to death. See, it's the same with all sin. No one just ever happens to commit adultery. It didn't just happen overnight. Sometimes we will make statements like, I saw him fall into sin. No, you didn't see him fall into sin. You just saw him hit the ground. He was falling for a long, long time, and what you're seeing is the end result. No one just happened to just fall into something out of nowhere. That's why the writer of Proverbs would write, guard your heart above everything else. Watch what you're doing. Be careful what you're doing. You don't just fall into sin. If you're not careful, your small sins will eventually destroy you. Be on guard. Finally, even the worst sinners can be forgiven. Even the worst sinners can be forgiven. That text, Genesis 4, we read the evil murder of Cain, but over and over we see the grace of God in this story. There's a warning that God gives him in verse 7. that says, be careful where you're headed. You have time to change. Be careful before you do this sin. And then there's a mark that protects Cain. And that mark gives him time to repent. As I read the story, it seems that God cares for Cain and wants him to do right. And even after his murder, it spares him the death penalty and allows him to live many, many more years. God shows Cain more mercy than he deserves. We see no evidence that Cain repents, but that doesn't conceal the truth 
or cancel the truth that he had so many opportunities to do so, but apparently never took advantage of it. I think Francis Schaeffer was so right when he speaks about Cain and Abel as two leaders in the two great lines of humanity. They represent two seeds, two directions, two value systems, two moralities, two races of people. They're real people, but they also stand at the headwaters of the human race. You are either standing with Cain in unbelief or you are standing with Abel in faith. And you see, the ultimate irony is the followers of Cain and the followers of Abel, they're thoroughly mixed together. The line that separates the human race cuts through every nation, every tribe, every culture, every city, every town, every village, through every neighborhood, through every school, every store, every office, and ultimately through every single family. This is why you can have followers of Cain and followers of Abel living together, working together, and even sleeping side by side on the same bed. And it's certain you cannot always tell which is which, but God has no trouble knowing the difference of who's his and who's not his. Abel represents those sinners who come to God by faith in Jesus and therefore receive salvation. Cain stands for all of us who are proud, self-made people that think that we bring something to the table when we come to God and that God has to accept us based on what we did. It is a way of religion versus the way of faith, the way of self-righteousness versus God's righteousness. Do it yourself, religion, versus putting your faith in Jesus. See, on the basis of that truth, I have to ask, offer you a word of warning. Your religion will not save you. Listen, even good religion will not save you. Showing up here every Sunday morning will not save you. Being baptized will not save you. But can I suggest to you, your religion will damn you. Because if you think that because of what you've done, God has to accept you, you will be damned. God will look at you and say, no deal. Even good religion can send you to hell if you don't have faith in your heart. Cain would have made an excellent church member. I mean, he brings an offering. Most of us forget to bring an offering on a Sunday morning, but he brings his offering. Except for this one fact, he was lost. He was lost. You can write over this story, the ancient words of Jesus in John 3. You must be born again. There is no other hope. There is no other way. If you want your life changed, you must step out of the line of Cain and into the line of Abel by trusting Jesus and accepting his death as the complete payment for your sins. So let me press the question to every person in this room listening, have you been born again? What's your answer to that question? See, if you answer no or I don't know, then can I encourage you this morning to run to the cross? Run to Jesus. Because listen, he loves you. You're here because he loves you. You're here because he cares for you and cares for your soul. Put your faith in Jesus who loved you and died for you. Lay hold of Jesus. Open your heart to him. If you want salvation, you must enter by the way of cross or you cannot enter at all. You know, there's one final irony of this story. Cain the evil murdered Abel the righteous. The man who believed God died the guilty man lived. Cain appears to get away with murder. But that's only a temporary judgment. In the end, Abel looks good and Cain looks bad. Those who live by faith in this world may not be famous or popular, but they may, and they might not be appealing to the world. But you know, in the eyes of God, Abel was declared righteous by God, even though he was murdered. So you can't always tell whom God approves by how well-known or how popular they are. And you can't tell whom God approves simply by how long a person lives. Just the fact that you live a long life doesn't mean you have God's approval. I look at these men and women who are losing their lives for Jesus 
in Syria and Iraq, I'm saying these men and women are hearing well done, good and faithful servant by their maker. Just because you live an old, long life doesn't mean you have God's approval. Death is never the last word in the life of a righteous man. Abel is murdered, yet he's the one who went to heaven. Hebrews 11 says that even though Abel is dead, he still speaks to us. See, it's ironic, ironic because when he was on earth, his faith couldn't even convince his own brother. But now that he is dead, his faith speaks to the entire world. And he is more alive today than he was when he lived on this earth. Listen, that's what faith does. Listen, though the world may hate you and they may even try to kill you, it cannot destroy you. That's why scripture says in Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of Jesus? Not even death. For those who are in Christ Jesus, our God. As we come to the table this morning, I want to invite you to examine your heart. Only you know your motive and your reason for being here. Only you know whether you're here to gain acceptance by God based on what you do. That somehow because you're here and you're doing this stuff that God is going to accept you. Or you're here because you know that he's already accepted you and you are now here out of an overflow of worship and gratitude for what he's done in your life. Only you do know that. Would you examine your heart this morning? Are you trying to get God's approval and therefore doing the things that you do? Or are you doing the things that you do because you already have the approval and the acceptance of God? And if it is the former, can I suggest to you that you are headed in the wrong direction? Because this table reminds us that we are accepted not on the basis of what we have done. We're not accepted because we figured this out and somehow found God and that's why God accepts us. But this table reminds us that he loved us while we were the worst of sinners. He accepted us when we were full of flaws. He loved, and loved us enough that he would come and reside inside of us. He is daily changing us, daily transforming us. We are accepted. We are loved. We are forgiven. We belong to Jesus. If you're here this morning out of an attitude of worship, I'm going to invite you to come to the table, grab the elements, and come with worship saying, thank you, God. Thank you for Jesus who gave his life for me so that I can be a part of the family of God. And if you're here simply trying to earn God's approval, I invite you to come. Come to God and repent and then come to the table and acknowledge God. I am trying to do this on my own, but I can't. I need your spirit to remind me that you've already accepted me. You've already approved of me, that I am loved by you. So I'm going to invite you to examine your heart and your attitudes, your affections, your desires this morning. And whenever you are ready, the way we do communion here at Love City, the worship team will sing. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements and go back to your seats. And then as soon as the worship is done, I'll come back up and we'll partake of communion together. Would you just spend some time with Jesus and then let's celebrate his death and resurrection together.